Thanks to the organizing committee for uh, providing me with the opportunity to present today. So uh, Sharon gave a great segue for my talk. Um, I don't have any disclosures. Uh, these are the objectives of the uh, presentation. Uh, again, I'm um, not going to bela uh, belabor this uh, point, but um, in terms of the global incidence of colorectal cancer in Canada, actually, we have one of the highest uh, worldwide. And again, Sharon spoke to uh, the various reasons and associations for that. Um, I'm going to focus uh, primarily today on screening for those with sporadic cancers and those with a family history. Uh, and it's outside the scope of my talk to discuss some of the um, hereditary syndromes. Um, so there's different risk levels for developing colorectal cancer with um, average risk uh, and are as the targets of screening, having a 6% six six lifetime risk of colorectal cancer. Then there's a group of individuals who are at increased or moderate risk, those with a family history of colorectal cancer or advanced adenoma, those with a personal history of those uh, lesions or a personal history of cancer, and again, Sharon alluded to inflammatory bowel disease. These individuals have a 2 to 4 increased lifetime risk of colorectal cancer compared to those with average risk. And again, the high-risk individuals, those with up to or greater than a 40% chance of uh, developing colorectal cancer over their lifetime, which include the common familial and hereditary syndromes. I'm going to focus my talk on this group of individuals. So what is screening? Basically, it's the examination of asymptomatic people in order to classify them as likely or unlikely to have the disease. And uh, as you can imagine, colorectal cancer is actually an ideal disease for screening because it uh, has all of the characteristics for a screening test. It's a common disease. It's burdensome. Uh, tests are safe and easy to implement. And we can detect uh, precancerous lesions that are treatable, leading to improved mortality and cost-effective strategies. Uh, so I'm going to review a variety of different modalities for screening, including both uh, stool-based tests and then direct visualization or structural tests, uh, as well as a new serology test that's on the market. Uh, what are we doing when we're assessing our screening modalities? We want to evaluate the effectiveness of screening and reducing incidence of and mortality from colorectal cancer. We have to assess the test performance characteristics for detecting their precursor lesions and look at the adverse effects associated with different screening modalities. So let's look briefly at each. So this is a high sensitivity FOBT for average risk screening. There's actually fairly good RCT evidence for a reduction of mortality and incidence. However, it is less sensitive for advanced adenomas than for detecting colorectal cancer. And performance characteristics vary widely by uh, version of the test. So no longer are the low sensitivity FOBTs recommended for screening, but high sensitivity versions are still uh, part of the armamentarium. The advantage is non-invasive, relatively inexpensive, but there's a high non-compliance rate, requires multiple samples, and uh, individuals need to have dietary and medication restrictions to complete the test accurately. So this is in contrast to FIT, or the fecal immunohistochemical test, which derives uh, its effectiveness from indirect evidence. It's been shown to be equivalent or superior in performance compared with the FOBT. Again, less effective for advanced adenomas than cancer and not sensitive for serrated lesions. Uh, variable test performance is based on the brand. Uh, similar uh, advantages and disadvantages to uh, FOBT with the addition that there are no dietary or medication restrictions and it can usually be done in a single sample. Uh, the fit fecal DNA uh, for average risk screening is a relatively new kit on the block. Uh, again, derives from indirect evidence. It's actually got the highest single time testing sensitivity for colorectal cancer of any non-invasive non-imaging test. And it is also sensitive for detecting serrated polyps. But it has decreased sensi er, specificity uh, compared with fit. It's more expensive than the other stool-based tests and has a higher false positive rate. So let's look now at our direct visualization tests, including colonoscopy. So there's no RCT evidence uh, supporting uh, mortality and incidence reduction, but we extrapolate from RCTs of sigmoidoscopy. The big advantage of colonoscopy is it offers both early detection and prevention of colorectal cancer through polypectomy. But it does have disadvantages in that the individual needs to take a full bowel preparation. There are uh, risk of complications, and it's the most expensive test for screening that we have. An alternative would be CT colonography. Um, again, similarly extrapolates data from sigmoidoscopy. It's been shown to have similar sensitivity and specificity for cancer and ad adenomas comparable to colonoscopy. 
uh, fewer complications in colonoscopy, but requires a bowel preparation. If it, there is a positive test, the individual may need a second bowel preparation for colonoscopy. And there are incidental extracolonic findings, which may require workup with unclear benefit through burden balance. Flexible sigmoidoscopy for average risk screening is still something to be discussed. Um, it actually has RCT uh, level evidence of um, mortality and incidence reduction. And in fact, one recent RCT showed uh, reduced mortality in patients randomized to uh, flexible sigmoidoscopy plus a one-time fit as opposed to flexible sigmoidoscopy alone. Uh, lower risk of complications. The main disadvantages are that um, it's really uh, decreased in availability and utilization, particularly in North America recently, and there's a lack of quality standards. Very briefly, capsule colonoscopy for average risk screening, it's actually not approved for that purpose, but has been approved for evaluating the proximal colon in people with incomplete colonoscopies. It's actually a more extensive bowel preparation than colonoscopy, um, and there's a lack of robust data uh, as to its effectiveness currently. Finally, the SEPT-9 assay for average risk screening. A uh, recently approved blood test to detect circulating methylated septin-9 DNA, which is a biomarker for colorectal cancer. Uh, it's been uh, marketed for a test for average risk individuals who have refused all other screening modalities. Uh, there are some concerns regarding the sensitivity and specificity of the test. Advantage being it's just a blood test. Disadvantages are that we don't have robust data and it's not currently FDA approved for unrestricted use in screening. So let's focus now on the average risk screening guidelines. Here is a compilation of a number of different uh, major societies' uh, guidelines, uh, most recently from 2018. And I want to draw your attention to recent updates in terms of the screening population. This is, uh, uh, segues nicely from Sharon's talk on the increasing incidence in younger individuals. Um, so basically, uh, based on some of the uh, population-based data, a uh, few of the societies have now recommended starting average risk screening at age 45. The American Cancer Society for all individuals, the American Society of Colorectal Surgeons for all individuals, and the uh, Multi-Society Task Force recommends starting at age 45 for uh, black Americans. I'll also draw your attention uh, to the screening beyond age 75. Uh, most of the societies provide a provision for considering a screening, particularly if there's been no prior screening in someone in this age group, uh, but you need to take into consideration what their life expectancy is, uh, comorbidities, et cetera. In terms of uh, the guidelines by society, for the most part, um, they offer a variety of options for average risk screening, and you can see that they're listed below. They don't provide any weighting as to which screening option you should choose, and you should take into consideration uh, patient preference and local availability, with the exception of the um, multi-society task force, which preferentially uh, recommends colonoscopy over the other modalities. Uh, and it also makes a comment on the use of capsule colonoscopy, but you'll note that none of the major societies currently recommend the septin 9 assay for average risk screening. Uh, the slide's a bit small here, but I wanted to segue into uh, those individuals at increased risk due to family history of colorectal cancer. Uh, again, a number of societies have uh, uh, released guidelines on this. Some stratify by age, and some uh, talk about uh, any age for first and second degree relatives. There are variations, but uh, the take-home message that is, if you have a first-degree relative with colorectal cancer, screening should begin at or before age 40, and colonoscopy is the modality of choice. But for second-degree relatives with colorectal cancer, you can either use average risk screening or colonoscopy starting at age 50. There are also some guidelines around increased risk due to family history of adenomatous polyps, and this may also be extrapolated to sessile serrated polyps. Um, again, restricted to first-degree relatives, some societies stratified by age, but for most first-degree uh, relatives with advanced adenomas, screening should begin at or before age 40, colonoscopy or fit as the modality of choice with varying intervals recommended. For non-advanced adenomas, um, most, uh, well, the Canadian Association of Gastroenterology actually recommends average screening, whereas the ASCRS uh, treats all adenomas similarly in terms of their recommendations. 
uh, briefly in the last minute or so, I'm going to talk about post-polypectomy surveillance. It's important to differentiate between low-risk and high-risk adenomas. Um, basically, people who have been found to have low-risk adenomas on their baseline colonoscopy actually have similar uh, rates to high, of high-risk adenoma as those who had a normal baseline colonoscopy. Their incidence of uh, colorectal cancer and mortality is actually similar to those with normal baseline. And if you look, um, they actually have a lower risk of mortality in colorectal cancer compared with the general population. So basically, surveillance... Um, is indicated for people who are found of high-risk adenomas, but there's no evidence currently to support surveillance in people with low-risk adenomas. Uh, newer additions to the guidelines incorporate uh, serrated polyps, uh, three types being hyperplastic polyps located in the rectum and sigmoid with virtually no malignant potential. But any uh, hyperplastic polyp greater than a centimeter, particularly in the proximal colon, should be considered a sessile serrated polyp and should be considered for surveillance. And the features of high-risk sessile serrated polyps, similar to advanced adenomas, are size, number, and presence of dysplasia. So the AGA and the Multi-Society Task Force <clears throat> provided some updates to their post-polypectomy surveillance in 2012. Essentially, uh, recommending surveillance on the basis of size and histology. And again, the only thing to note here is that, in fact, if you've had a baseline colonoscopy with a low-risk adenoma, and then your first surveillance colonoscopy following that, there's no adenoma, you can actually extend the uh, surveillance um, interval to 10 years. Again, for serrated lesions, uh, similar recommendations uh, based on histology and number found. I just wanted uh, to put a little local uh, bent on things here in Ontario, guided by the Cancer Care Ontario in 2018. Most of our um, recommendations uh, are similar to what's existing in the current guidelines, with the exception that now if we find one to two small low-risk adenomas on a baseline colonoscopy, we actually don't recommend surveillance. We recommend returning to the screening pool with uh, FIT in five years. So in summary, colorectal cancer is an ideal disease for screening. The incidence of colorectal cancer is increasing in people under 50. Multiple screening modalities exist for average risk screening. And the modality of choice for people at increased risk of colorectal cancer remains by and large colonoscopy. Post-polypectomy surveillance depends on histology and number of polyps. Thank you.